So for this video, I want to give the audience and people who are looking at 4Geeks Academy as a potential boot camp that they want to attend, a basic background of how we make curriculum decisions and who's making our curriculum decisions. So let's start it off right. Who do we have here today? Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm, I'm Alejandro. I'm one of the co-founders of the school, a uh, software developer since I was 13 years old. Uh, computer engineer and yeah, I've been doing uh, this uh, teaching with the school and, and co-founded it since 2016. 2016, man. Time flies. Seven years in. How do you feel? Oh, excuse yeah. me. We're closer to eight now, right? <laughs> yeah, that's what happens to me. I still say like we are yeah. five years in. <laughs> Time flies. How does it feel? Yeah, how does it feel? Well, it feels good because every, every time we are a little bit better, right? So it mm -hmm. feels good to see how the the years have passed and the curriculum has improved. And yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm pretty happy with, with what we have right now. Awesome. Awesome. So let's let's get into the details now. Can you explain to me the philosophy that basically guides your decision making when it comes to exactly what to include and what to exclude from the curriculum? Yeah, so everything starts from employability, right? Like we, we go, we're constantly getting feedback from the students and, and from the career support department on, on the things that are, that companies are looking for, right? So um, some, for, actually it's hard to, when it comes to technology, it's hard to not get excited about a new technology and then everyone wants to put it into the syllabus and the teachers start mm -hmm. pressuring about that. But then we cannot, we cannot just incorporate it, even though it's fun and, and yeah. may, may have been enjoying it. Um, mm -hmm. What turns out is that it takes a lot of time for the technology to mature and to even be adopted like generally in the industry. So, for example, there are plenty of things right now in the syllabus, plenty of things, actually the majority of things that I would say are not as exciting as they may be if you are looking for for like the latest and and more most fun of them but i know and right. everyone accepts after after having to to have a like a like a clear mind everyone accepts mm -hmm. that it's not about getting having fun it's about getting the job right and the majority of the companies right. years to to adopt the technology so and it, it may not be end up like sometimes it, 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 the adoption is like 20% and that's not enough, you know, and, and we keep. Mm -hmm. So we focus on get, getting you a lot of opportunities, but not on getting you the, let's say, the highest salary at first, because those technologies are completely different. So w we mm -hmm. are about getting you a, a job fast, but maybe if you want to grow up more in your, in your career and you want to have like a higher salary, eventually you may have to transition into a different technology that it's going to take way more time to learn, but can take, get you to higher salaries, basically. Right. So you, you really want to get the fundamentals down, make sure that you're broadly employable. And then once you have that initial success, then you can get extravagant. Then you can start playing with technologies, exactly. making widgets, you know, building things on your own on the weekend if you're really excited about it. Or for that second job opportunity, you learn a more specific stack right you learn a more technical like stack a, absolutely specificity will get you in 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 a higher salary than j being generalistic and also you will also have a lot of chances to get hired when you're very very specific but the problem mm -hmm. is that you will only get hired by a certain group of companies only so you're reducing your let's say the amount of opportunities but you're getting higher chances and to get hired into those opportunities but the problem is that to get specialized, you need more time, right? So our approach mm -hmm. is less specialization. I mean, we do specialize in, in JavaScript and, and, and Python because those are the two biggest, um, grow, faster growing languages in the world and most employable. But um, we, we have to, and we pick only one, like one specific framework for each. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, those are the, the most used frameworks. and. The majority, when you when you search on job portals like LinkedIn for mm -hmm. opportunities in those, oh, it's like I don't know one order of magnitude uh, more opportunities than in most of the other ones. So you learn very few technologies, and that covers broadly the the majority of the things that you're going to be doing on a daily basis as a software engineer. 
And if you learn those things, you can spend way less time learning it on the front end. And when I say front end, I don't mean like front end technologies, I mean prior to. And you basically accomplish all the things that you're going to need in order to be an, a successful employee very rapidly. Exactly. Yeah. And that's but, the idea behind a boot camp, right? Is, is accelerated learning when compared to more conventional educational paths. Exactly. And, and it's like a lot of the things that you're doing in the boot camp, you don't realize that you're learning something. It's not about the technology only, right? Like, for example, putting things together. It's, it's a science as well, and that's what has advanced the most through the years, that we have actually tested all the possible ways in we can teach and how you can teach the fundamentals. For, for like, for example, a, a lot of senior developers will say, start from the back end, because those are the fundamentals, and that's what you need. And then, But we already tried that several times, actually several times, not only in, in the US, but in, in different markets as well, and it never paid off, because when you start from the back end and then you transition into the front end, then you don't practice the back end for a while. Like you stop practicing what you already learned and then you have to go mm -hmm. back into what you learned before, uh, afterward, and, and you, don't re you don't remember most of those things because it's, it's so fast, right? The pace is so fast. Yeah. So the order in which you teach those technologies can affect like in a very, it can influence a lot uh, how much you will retain over time. And that leads me to our teaching framework that basically focuses on stability. We have this metric that we call stability. And okay. what matters when you're learning is not only like, okay, you may get home and be happy and think that you understood, but then the next day it's like you're starting from scratch or the week after. And that's stability. And stability gets affected by many factors. Repetition is one of them, of course. Everyone understands, I think, for technical learning that when, for example, when you learn math, you have to repeat a lot so that you actually, uh, uh, it, it retrains on your, on your brain. But also, it's repetition over time, right? So the mm -hmm. only way to repeat over time is and keep moving on, because you have to keep moving on because it's, it's fast. So the only way to repeat over time and move on is to add on into the previous lesson so that you now go over the new lesson, but also review the previous lesson without knowing, because you have to right. use those, those not. So that's, a, that's an art, like putting things together in an incremental way. It's one of the hardest things, and it's one of the things that I would say I undermined most when I started. Like, as a senior developer, you undermine so many things, and one of them is how, how do you organize everything together in a, in a, in a, in a way that retention and stability, it's, it's higher. You know, I, I find it really interesting when you mentioned how teaching the back end to beginners first was not successful. And it makes total sense because I remember when I was learning to code for the first time, the ab the, how abstract the back end was made it very difficult for me to interface with it. There was nothing really tangible that I could see. And with the front end, it's like, if you make a modification to something that's visual, you see the change immediately. And it, it, it's so obvious to you. It's intuitive. You have, to, you have to have fun, right? If you don't have fun and you don't get dopamine, then mm -hmm. also you would not learn enough. Uh, you would not be as motivated. So you're right. It, I didn't mention that part, but that's another important part of using the front end first. Yeah. Right. Okay. Now I want to move on to logistics. What can a student expect when it comes to... What will a day of learning look like at Four Geeks Academy? What are lessons like? You know, what is the material? Is there pre-work ahead of class? And then once they're in class, is it a lecture for the whole time? Or is it half lecture, half class work? And then what resources exist outside the classroom to assist the student? Now, I know that was like 400 questions, but pick them however yeah. you want. Well, um uh, and this comes back to stability again. Like when you want to have memory stability, you need to have um, something called active learning. And active learning is something that was not invented by us. It's actually a, a, a proven method for learning that is one of the most effective ones. And, and all the major Ivy League universities try using them. Um, and I say the word try because active learning doesn't mean, oh, let's just throw a project at you. And do it, you know, because that's that's like undermining the process. Like you would not, if you just tell a student, you know, learn on your own, and here's the here's the instructions of the project, then it will eventually not lead to stability because you will not have fun and you will be stuck and so many things, right? So it needs to be in companion with 
having self-direction. And the only way to give you active and self-directed learning is by giving you a lot of constant feedback, right? So when, when, when you think about um, when you think about logistics, the, the way that we uh, try and, and approach this process is we don't want, and this is not about learning, it's more about our mission, we don't want to put requirements on the courses. Like we want to we wanna be the first job for most of the people. Like when, when you graduate, it's for your first job, not for your second job or for your advanced mm -hmm. degree or anything. So that mandates removing requirements right we want to if you want to transition into a new into a new career or into tech we we cannot have any any requirements if you need requirements then we need to do some additional coursework so that you can comply with those requirements right so we take care of everything and that starts with a lot of care right like if i want to give you if i want to give you active and self-directed learning then the best way obviously but the, the most expensive one is to put a lot of human interactions and mentors um there so that's that's what we focus on on the period we actually have someone that is going to be assigned to you as a student and it will follow up with you like twice or or three times i don't know it depends on every student but it will follow up with you on your pre-work journey that is super small like you think about it like mm -hmm. following up with you three times in two weeks is is a lot like it's it's a lot of attention to see how you're doing but at the same time you're doing it right. wrong. on your own i mean like on your on at home because we want to make sure that you have the commitment and you want to sit down and put the hours. And right. then after, after you do the pre-work and we level up those students into, uh, let's say that you can, some students may be bored by it, may think, I already know this, and some others are, are not, but that's, mm -hmm. that's okay because we want to guarantee a certain level of, of skills. Yeah, creating the floor, right? Like setting the floor. Yeah. Like we want to be sure that we're at least here by the time we start off with lecturing, yeah, I hear that. and then and then after that, uh, every day at the academy will be will look like not every day, but the the, the school days. You can think about it like because we don't want to put school uh, school day every day. If we do that, then we are going against our mission as well because we wanna we wanna try and remove all the barriers to becoming a, a web developer or to getting into tech. It could be data science or cybersecurity, and the way the the other the second wall is the time, right? The first one is the skills, the, the, the bare bone, the level up skills, and the second one will be the time. So we don't want you to be having to put 40 hours a week to become, um, uh, to get into tech and get your first job for let's say six months or having to quit your current job. So we wanna give yeah. you breaks, one day breaks. So we try to be like intermittent, right? Like uh, one day you have school, the other day you don't have school. Obviously the weekends are are different for the weekends we sometimes organize workshops we try to have always something for the students on the weekends but it happens life happens and sometimes students don't 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 utilize their, their weekends to to do any school day or they don't come to the workshops or something so it's optional and that's why we have worked so hard on putting a lot of technology f there for you to get a lot of feedback when you are not at school. So the school day is 30 minutes of, of lessons, like where the teacher will go over the, the, the syllabus and, and the lessons that you were supposed to know when you came to class. And then you have two hours and a half. And this is general, right? Like some, some teachers take an hour. And, and if you're taking more than an hour, then we need to, we need to intervene and tell the teacher, listen, it, it cannot be more than, more than an hour. Because yeah. how much are you really, how much are you even retaining past an hour? You know, like Nothing. how much of a lecture can you tolerate at once? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. you're absolutely right. And, and you have to think this is remote, right? The majority of mm -hmm. the students take the, the coursework remotely. So it's like you are for an hour looking at a screen. It's, it's even worse than having an hour of, of lectures. An hour of remote yeah. lectures, it's, you can think about it like twice as hard to, mm -hmm. to retain. So yeah. It takes a while for teachers to become very good. So we have to focus a lot on the training uh, to be very good at mentioning only the things you need to know, you know, because sometimes, sometimes you may say a word or, or say something that will screw the entire class because now people thought they understood and now they're completely confused. So it takes, it's super hard to synthesize everything in 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then 
after you finally synthesize it in 30 minutes, then you are supposed to give, and this is what we pressure a lot, and we measure it as well, to give the students time to practice now. So we have two types of practice. The first one is um, a highly repeat, uh, with high repetition, uh, where there's a tool that we developed internally, it's called LearnPack, and it comes with unit testing for most of the things you're gonna be doing. It comes with two minute video solutions for these exercises, so there's like, there's like a hundred, let's say, there's more than a hundred, but let's say that for every exercise, it, it's supposed to take you just a few minutes, let's say 30 minutes, and then there's a video on two, that takes two minutes to understand how you're supposed to do it in, in, during those 30 minutes, like the video solution. And then you have, now that we, we have already released our AI tool, that now will actually look at your code, and it's already being used by the students, since two weeks ago, right? So this is something new. And it will look at your code and give you feedback already on, on the things that you're doing wrong, right? So, so we're actually getting into, into almost a real-time quality feedback during, mm -hmm. during the exercises that you're doing. And then for the projects, um, the projects are a little bit more um, unattended so that this is where you actually put together all your skills. And then you're supposed to do the project at home or you can start the project in class. So the, third, the, the three hours of class, it will be the lessons, then some practice, and then some projects. Sometimes there's no practice, and mm -hmm. sometimes there's no project, but only a few times. It's like, I don't know, like 95% of the classes will be with, with a project, and maybe 40% of the classes may have some exercises that you have to do. And whatever you don't do during the class, you will do later on at home. Because everything, it's, it's been, it's put online and even your coding environment, it's online. You don't, you don't, need, you don't need any like particular laptop or, or powerful laptop. You can just use an iPad and it will still work. It's not ideal, but it will still work because everything is running on the cloud. Okay. So yeah, that's, oh. how you remove, that's how you remove um, barriers to code, right? And that's how you increase mm -hmm. memory stability. Now, uh, people think in terms of hours, right? They're in the practice of doing this because a lot of people think about work in terms of hours. So it's an easy way to organize their life. How many hours should they expect to, to contribute to this in order to have a good experience? Well, it actually depends on every person. I think there, the, what is true is that everyone learns at, the, at, at a different pace. That's extremely true. I don't, I don't agree with the idea on, on saying like, I am dumber than, than this person or or maybe maybe coding is not for me because I, I'm taking twice the time than this other person is taking because in the end you will be learning you will be learning a lot of the things in let's say two years and then you already have the foundation so you don't have to keep learning super fast, right? You will just use what you know already. So mm -hmm. So I think um, w w when it comes to to hours that you're going to be using during the during the week, it may take you twice the time. But in general, we do have a general metric, and we say that 19 hours will be the amount of time that an average person will require to. Okay. But you need to put the 19 hours, like, and it needs to be spread in a specific way. So yeah. I rather have I rather for you to have three hours every day and then it, it will amount to 19, then having 19 hours mm -hmm. on a Sunday, and that's it, you know, because you, <laughs> you don't repeat, right? Right, yeah. right, and you, you have to consider what percentage of the time you spend on that Sunday is actually effectively spent, because you are a human, not a machine, right? So, you know, how, how, how hard can you really go for how long is, a, is an right. important question. That's why it's important to get that distribution, like you're saying. I, okay, I'm so... Sure. We, we've talked about philosophy, we've talked about logistics, now let's talk about how do we select the people to teach? How do we select the teachers? What's the process there? Okay, so in, in, in terms of teach, selecting teachers, to be honest, the hardest part, because it's the most artisanal part, if you think about it. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, finally, you, you hire someone, right? And that person mm -hmm. will have, it doesn't matter how much you try to control the way that the teacher is supposed to to deliver the class or everything it will always be artisanal because the teacher will will have a personality and will have ways of doing things 
So for us, it's super hard getting to to have like the ideal teacher, right? So that what we do is that we know that we don't want to hire teachers that only teach. That's the first thing for us. Like you cannot only teach. You have to be at war. You know, you have to be in the front of the war. <laughs> yeah. Having the experience. So that's the first thing. That already makes this way less appealing to teachers to teach because they will always earn more being a developer than being a teacher, right? So it is... Mm -hmm. It, it already filters a lot of people because the, the only teachers we will end up having are the ones that are very good at their jobs, but they enjoy giving back, basically. Because no mm -hmm. one is going to be super happy by by charging, I don't know, 50% less for the hours for teaching because some of these people mm -hmm. work at Amazon and, 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 and really big companies and, and it's hard for us to keep up with the rates, right? So, yeah, that's one thing. So we, we want teachers working at the best possible jobs. Then the, the second thing would be the, the, we ask them to explain things and, and we want them to be... You know how some people like to explain things with the right words and then some other people like to explain things with the words that you will understand, mm -hmm. not the right words necessarily. So... Right. We are more of the school of choosing the words that you will be understanding. The, the, the purpose of words is fundamentally to communicate ideas. So if you're ineffective in communicating an idea, then that's not the right word or the, the right set of words. So right. whatever set of words contributes to, a highest, to, to the highest percentage of students understanding the material is the correct way to say it, is the correct way to present it. Yeah, but at the same time, think about this. Like, they will argue, okay, but um, the, that's the word, the industry word for it. So if you don't learn that word, then you will not be able to communicate later, right? So okay. yeah. that's one of the arguments, right? And, and I don't agree with that argument because I think, okay, okay, eventually you do have to learn that word. But it's like I'm putting more barriers into you. So you know how right. learning to code is about persistence, really. I, I don't think, and this is something I haven't mentioned, but... I don't think you need to be super smart to learn how to code. And I don't, you don't need any math, none of that, right? So what you need is to be resilient. That's what you need because it's, it's I, I would say that learning code is similar to learning skateboarding. So you don't, when you see someone skateboarding, you, you will not say like, oh, that person is super smart that it's using skateboarding. <laughs> you, you don't say yeah. that. What you say is, okay, that person has put a lot of work into it because you can see how... The tricks. Yeah. Right. It, it is a similar But not, case. not only that, exactly. It, but it's exactly correct is persistence because you know in order for that person to get good at skate, skateboarding, they had to fall. And they had to fall a lot and get back up. Right. And exactly. I, I think that's exactly what coding is like. It's like, oh, okay, this is the same error message that I've, I've had on my screen for the past five hours. What do I do? You know, right. like, how do you deal with that? And how do you deal with that psychologically? Forget about the technical problem for a second. You're going to be sitting there reflecting on, am I a quality person? Like, do I even have what it takes to succeed in this manner? And you have to break through that. You have to persist despite those barriers existing. Exactly. So we don't want to put more barriers. And words are one of the biggest barriers if you, if you get technical. Like if I start mm -hmm. lecturing you on how amazing I'm speaking and speaking like this industry person, it doesn't really make any progress on the students. You will and they will end up confused, not motivated. So for us, imagine how challenging it is that you hire this highly technical person that it's working on a amazing company, and then from the moment you're hiring, you're you're you have to be very. We, our instinct is to perceive if that person is willing to teach, or it's it's just. They just want to be like showing off, you know, because they're yeah. right there, right? So Flex, flexing their muscles. Exactly. So we, we try, we try to have this empathy on the first, on the on the on the interviews where we ask them to explain things and we see how they behave, right? Without saying a lot of things, like let's say if they start lecturing us or, or they really want us to understand, and we have this question where we ask, can you explain to me like I'm nine years old? Because if you're able to explain like a nine-year-old person. Like, an, like to a nine-year-old person, then I think it's going to be fine. You know, everything is going to be amazing. Yeah. And it's hard. I mean, sometimes it takes like five minutes for them to think, and that's it. And we don't care. We actually tell them, we don't care if, you, if it takes a while for you to answer. Because the way that we think about it, it's not, you don't know the, it's not like you don't know the content. It's more like you have never 
synthesize it so much and in such in a, in a simple way. You don't have to, because when you are in the industry, you can just plainly speak in technical words. But when you are <laughs> teaching, you have to be way better than when you're in the industry, because you have to you have to put it in, in, in such a dumb way. Like Einstein said, like, if you can explain ideas in five words, that's when you actually understand them. It's not not at the beginning or in the middle. Like when you like the the energy um, the energy um, how do you say the formula? The, the are you talking about E equals M C squared? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like that. Like when you come up to something so simple, that's when you mm -hmm. mastered it. So for us, right. it's, it's about that. It's all about so. Uh, there, it involves some trial and error because you never know how the teacher is going to end up behaving after you hire the teacher, and it's because it it may be very good in the interview sometimes. So we have a very good onboarding process in place where the program managers have to follow up with the teacher the first five classes. So the first one is always a mess. It doesn't matter how amazing the person is; it's always a mess. When so obviously we don't want to have teachers that teach for the first time because it's always a mess it doesn't matter it was a mess for me i had students stand up and, and leave when i was starting <laughs> it happened to me twice so and and i didn't realize what i was doing wrong right but i was definitely doing something wrong it doesn't happen to me <laughs> right yeah and and i was very skilled right so i thought okay I'm, this mm -hmm. is gonna be this is gonna be great I, i'm gonna be great at it and i wasn't so yeah, the, this, this follow-up is that we actually watch the video, the video recordings of the class and then we give them feedback immediately afterwards and then we have to meet with them 15 minutes before the class to choose the explanations and we tell them, okay, how are you going to approach this explanation, and this one? And once the, we have the first five classes, then they get the, they get the idea on, on mm -hmm. what is the process. Like, for example, one of the things we have is choose your metaphor. Right? Like, you have to come to the class with a metaphor already. So if you're going to explain HTML, you have to talk about buildings, maybe, and the structure of the building, or the human body, and the skeleton, like, it doesn't matter. And then for the CSS, you will talk about skin color, or if it's a building, you will talk about how, how you're going to um, put, how do you call the style it, how you're going to tile it, right? So yeah. And then for every, every concept, we recommend, we actually, the student have, the teacher has uh, recommended metaphors uh, on, the, on the platform. But sometimes they, they like to have their own, obviously. You're a human. And Whatever that. is intuitive to them, because they'll be better able to explain a metaphor that they feel, you know, a closer yeah. attachment to. 100%, yeah. Awesome. Well, that seems like a very thorough process for selecting, vetting, and then keeping in place good teachers. So one last thing before we end up here is, what is your mechanism for updating the curriculum? How, how do you close that feedback loop? How do you get the information necessary to make sure the curriculum is what it needs to be. Yeah, that, that's another super hard thing. And another thing that we undermine at the beginning, because we wanted to be like the school with the most uh, up-to-date syllabus in the world, right? And, and obviously mm -hmm. that's easy when you don't have a lot of content. It's, it's <laughs> yeah. let's update this every day. It doesn't matter, right? Mm -hmm. But as you grow, and now we have three syllabus, we have thousands of, of lectures and, and, and um, exercises and projects and everything and we have put so much level of detail into each of them that it's it's really hard like you would need an army to do something like that so what we what we came up with is obviously as developers uh, I am a developer so I, I do um, embrace most of the things that are successful in the developer world and one of them is being open source and when people think about open source they think it's just okay open your source and that's not true Open source has a bunch of, it has a mission and a way of doing things. And we embrace all of it. Like uh, every time you see, let's say a misspell, uh, misspells are not the most common thing, but if you see a misspell, you will just be able, as a student, you will just be able to fix that misspell and it will become a proposal to fix the misspell. And then the, um, we have meetings, we have plenty of meetings about, we have a scrum that we run every week and then the program managers with the teachers have another scrum that they run every week and everything and all the, all the issues get put automatically into a single database where they get catalogued by graduates from the school as actually that this is an internship that we offer to them. So during the first uh, months of graduation, they have a job that is called quality assurance and then one of the things that they do is that they actually tag 
and catalog these issues and then they, they get sent for approval, basically. So when a student, let's say that you're on, I don't know, week one and you detect an error on a JavaScript code and it's not printing what it says that it should be printing, you will report that and propose the solution immediately and then it will get put into this pipeline of solutions and then after all the quality assurance and catalogation and everything gets done, then with only one button, then the, the syllabus manager can just accept that um, proposal. So we have today, we have, I don't know, like maybe 200 proposals per month that get sent not only by the students, but also by the teachers, by our mm -hmm. staff, everyone in the school, everyone gets trained, even the students, because the students are learning open source and, and that's a skill yeah. set needs to be not only for coding, like if you're doing, if you're doing um, open source is something that isn't being embraced in, in all the disciplines, even marketing, it's using now open source methods. So if you're doing cybersecurity, if you're doing data science, all of it, you will also have to be trained in the way of doing things open sourced because it's a skill that you will require to get hired. Um, the school method and, and the issues and all of that, it's, it's now a standard. So everyone is contributing to the syllabus. And that's how we maintain. That's more maintenance than new, right? But then at the same time, we, we do have a pool of people that actually students as well, by the way, graduates, that we have a content calendar in which we ask them to do articles on specific technologies that we know that they can explain because we don't teach for the second job, right? So we teach for the first job. So mm -hmm. anyone, any student can explain things in a way that will be understood by other any graduate can explain things in a way that will be understood by another student or a student that, that will read this maybe a month later. So we do have requirements for the students. We tell them what we want them to explain and we put that in a Kanban board and then the student will just have in the internship or as a freelance when they get paid afterwards uh, to work for the school, they will, they will get a request like, we want you to explain a, a React JS hook in particular, and, and then they, they give us the article in an open source way at the same time, because in open source, you can also create new content. You don't have to fix things. These proposals that you send, they can be for new content. So that's basically, it's like a machine that it's every day is throwing dozens of new articles or changes. And then our job is to curate basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, awesome. Well, I think we covered all our bases. We'll have to do this again sometime for sure. It was great speaking with you. I think I think this is going to be really valuable for people looking at Four Geeks Academy as a potential boot camp. No, thank you very much for for uh, hosting this session, man. I look forward on doing more to get deeper on any of these things and and give links and resources to the students to understand this better. Awesome. As well.